you for that very, very nice introduction. And I just want to say it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here at this wonderful, very prestigious uh, institution. And I'd really like to extend special thanks to my hosts, uh, to everyone involved in my visit here, um, especially Professor Ruck and uh, others who have been so kind and generous and attentive. And uh, I also look forward tomorrow to perhaps seeing a bit more of your beautiful city. It's a wonderful place. So I'm going to talk about DSM-5, as you've heard. And I think it clearly will change your clinical practice. It will change the practice of, of everyone, and um, hopefully for the better. So I'm going to start by saying just briefly how I think it will change clinical practice. Um, I'll talk a bit about a few of the guiding principles for change. Where we've been so far, it's, an, uh, it's a long, co complex, ongoing process. Where we are now, uh, some of the next steps, and some proposed changes. Can't really review all of them uh, in the amount of time I have, but I'll talk about some of the changes that have been proposed. And finally, um, I want to say how much we welcome input. This whole process has, has been a very open process, as you will hear. And there's time left in the DSM development process. No final decisions have been made. So we welcome input. And if some of you want to make comments today, I would welcome um, hearing them. Uh, input for further change or revision of what we have currently proposed. So my disclosure. So DSM-5 will change your practice and that of other clinicians in quite a number of ways. First, um, diagnostic criteria will be changed for many disorders. New specifiers and subtypes will be added for uh, two disorders. Existing ones may change a bit. New disorders will be added. Uh, some less well-studied disorders will be added to an appendix of criteria sets provided for further study. That's currently in DSM-4 um, to simulate additional research. Some disorders will be deleted. Um, I think the DSM-5 will be really improved by having increased recognition of cultural, gender-related, and developmental manifestations of disorders. I'll say a bit about that later. There will be an increasing focus on dimensions in addition to categories. Categories aren't going away. Um, uh, recommended measures will be included. The text, which is widely used for educational efforts uh, for students as well as clinicians, will be changed. And we're in the process of, of uh, thinking about how the text will be changed. But there, it will be different from DS. It will be, there'll be some similarities and some differences from DSM-4. I think uh, there'll be possible mention of genetic and environmental risk and protective factors, uh, neurocognitive factors, neuroimaging findings for disorders for which we feel we know enough to include this kind of information, but this is an advance from DSM-4 where this kind of information is uh, really minimal, uh, largely not present. Uh, the metastructure will likely be different. Uh, and by metastructure, I'm trying to get my pointer to work here. There it is. Uh, by metastructure, I mean the way the disorders are organized in DSM, what the chapters consist of and what disorders are included in them, which implies relatedness among disorders. We uh, ideally want to put disorders we think are related to one another within the same chapter. And I think a big difference, too, is that DSM will become a living document with more frequent updates than we've had for, DS than for any prior edition of DSM. We've had huge spans of time between editions of DSM, and the, the concern is it gets a little out of date. Um, and so the idea is there'll be a DSM 5.1 and 5.2 and 5.3 until we're ready for DSM 6 and perhaps uh, for these, uh, these point one and point two additions, we'll have updates as needed uh, to reflect emerging findings um, based on research and uh, uh, other advances in knowledge. So it's really amazing to think that DSM-4 was actually developed a few decades ago. Um, it was published in 1994. A long time has elapsed, and, and so much research has been done since then. We've learned so much about these disorders. The field has substantially advanced, and it really is time for DSM-5. And the goal of revisions is to enhance the reliability, 
validity where possible, and clinical utility, usefulness for practicing clinicians, for both clinicians and researchers. And strategies for improving DSM to move beyond a process of clinical consensus and build diagnoses on a foundation of empirical research findings from scientific disciplines. The, 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 we've, there's been a tremendous effort to make the changes as evidence-based as possible and to incorporate scientific advances that have ma been made over the past several decades into our diagnostic system, and there have been a lot. And there's also been a lot of international and multidisciplinary scientific uh, uh, participation in the DSM-5 revision process. That's a change from DSM-4, and I think it's given us a much broader and very valuable uh, perspective. So this evidence-based approach includes many strategies. First, we've done a lot of literature reviews. There's been a lot published in the past 20 years on so many of these disorders. And my work group alone did many of them. I don't know how many, uh, in the 20s, I think. Um, uh, literature reviews on, on specific issues that we were considering, possible changes we were considering for DSM-5, and what's been learned about these disorders in the past 20 years. Um, they've, uh, Depression and Anxiety, the journal Depression and Anxiety, has published two special issues um, of these literature reviews. Uh, we have another one coming out, and other journals have published uh, literature reviews from other work groups. There have been a tremendous number of secondary data analyses, so a lot of, a lot of advisors and work group members and others in the field have existing data sets that we have done additional analyses on to answer specific questions to inform possible changes we were thinking of making for DSM-5. We've surveyed experts. Um, we have many advisors. In addition to, uh, for my work group, you saw the list of work group members, but we have a very broad network of advisors, and we welcome even broader input um, from, from the field and have had a lot of excellent input. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about uh, DSM-5.org. I don't know if you've visited it. I encourage you to if you have not. Um, but we've got, we got a tremendous number of comments to our initial proposals. We have taken those, we've reviewed every one of them, taken them very seriously, and have made some changes in response. And field trials are about to begin, um, and the field trials will test uh, some of the, uh, many of the proposed changes uh, that have been made at this point. So I'll say a bit more about many of these steps. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happened so far. DSM, uh, planning for DSM-5 actually began back in 1999. There was a preliminary process that involved uh, publication of what are called white papers, monographs on specific topics, and research planning conferences. And, and uh, these processes, through these processes, um, no changes were made or no proposed, yeah, I guess there are some proposed changes. It, this was really helpful process that set the stage for the work of the work groups and the task force. Um, so nine white papers were published. Um, in, in here are two of them. It's the uh, research agenda for DSM-5 and age and gender considerations. Uh, these white papers uh, re uh, represented a partnership between the American Psychiatric Association, uh, National Institute of Mental Health, NIAAA, and NIDA. And the purpose was to stimulate research and discussion to improve the scientific basis of future classifications, meaning DSM-5 and DSM-6 and DSM-7. They were very broad and rather visionary in their approach. Um, and these have been published in APA uh, monographs. And I also mentioned uh, DSM-5 research planning conferences. These were 13 global research conferences held from 2004 to 2008. Uh, had many international participants, a collaborative effort uh, between these groups, including the World Health Organization. And again, the goal was to stimulate empirical research and promote international collaboration before uh, the formal development of DSM-5. And it, I think these conferences were really helpful. They really, um, uh, they, they brought together, literature reviews were done, they brought together leaders in the field, and there was one on obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders and uh, uh, fear circuitry disorders that have been, were, have been very helpful to my work group specifically, and I know to other work groups as well. 
So again, these conferences informed the, devel the development of DSM-5, although no decisions were made for DSM-5. And here are the, the, plan, uh, the conference topics. You can see a long list of very important topics that were, have been very informative for uh, the DSM-5 process. And a lot, of, a lot of documents came out of this, which, which you can have access to. Uh, nine monographs were published uh, based on the proceedings of these conferences and literature reviews that were done for these conferences. Um, and more than 100 journal, 120 journal articles came out of these conferences. So uh, I thought you might want to see the overall timeline for DSM-5. So this is uh, the white papers began back here, 1999. Uh, three additional ones were uh, commissioned in 2007. Um, here you see the conferences, the research planning conferences I just talked about uh, from 2003 to 2008. Uh, this is a website that was developed. And here you can see this is where the kind of the official uh, process got underway with uh, development of the task force and the work groups. Um, and we're doing our work over a span of five years from 2007 to 2012. So you can see we're kind of uh, a little bit, bit past the midway point, um, which means a lot of work has been done, but a lot is still going to happen. And so this is actually a good time if you have suggestions about anything we've done so far to let us know. Uh, the plan is for DSM-5 to be published in 2013 uh, to be followed by the publication of ICD-11. So uh, there's a task force. Uh, the work group chairs serve on the task force. There are health professionals from various stakeholder groups on the task force. Uh, then uh, 13 individual work groups uh, where members work in specific diagnostic areas and then many advisors for the work groups. And here are all the work groups. There are also cr what are called cross-cutting study groups, um, which uh, in f sort of are thinking about broader issues that are not specific to specific disorders and to inform the overall work of the work groups in the task force. So there's a diagnostic spectra study group, which is thinking about things like the meta structure, the overall organization of DSM and dimensional issues. Uh, how, uh, how to take a, a more of a developmentally sensitive approach to uh, the diagnostic system. Uh, gender and cross-cultural issues, psychiatric and general medical interface, uh, assessment of impairment and instrument development, uh, diagnostic assessment instruments. So the work of these groups is informing the entire process. 